great to see you here, and uh, welcome to the third lecture of Module 3 as we go through the New Testament. Tonight we are, among other things, going to look at Romans, the book of Romans, so I'm going to read a couple of well-known verses from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. That's how the Apostle Paul opens the letter to the Romans. And a little bit later on we're going to look at the book of Romans and uh, its significance and what impact it made in history. And then also look at the contents of, of the book uh, a little bit. But you know, I find it actually quite uh, phenomenal, the fact that Paul, who was a Jew, uh, to the point of persecuting the Christians because they said that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, actually changed so radically, and we looked at that a little bit in the book of Acts last week, changed so radically that here, uh, roughly towards the end of his third missionary journey, he still has not changed his mind in knowing that Jesus Christ is the answer uh, to the world and that Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, he goes on, and I'm not going to read the whole introduction of Romans, but as he continues to talk about the need for him to come to Rome and to share the gospel also with people in Rome and the church at Rome in especially, um, in particular, he says in verse 14, I'm bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. And then this uh, key passage, which I'm sure must be very, very familiar to most of us. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it, the gospel, is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now here is a man speaking or writing who used to believe that he can pursue a righteousness with God by keeping the law and doing the right things. And by doing the right things and by living right, he can actually uh, get God's attention and he can become righteous before God. And by living right, he can then win the favor of God. And here Paul is clearly saying that the gospel is about a righteousness that is revealed from God. In, in other words, it is God who takes the initiative. It is God who gives righteousness. And all that is required from us, and even that is given to us by God, is to believe, is faith. Um, and therefore he quotes um, from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous will live by faith. Uh, it is by faith and by faith alone that one can be declared righteous. No wonder that this book has made such an impact on the life of a person such as Martin Luther, who again, as the church over years, hundreds of years, drifted slowly but surely, um, it is just in our human nature to think it cannot be that easy. There's got to be something I have to do. And so those some things, the church and we all are very guilty of, of accumulating and gathering and, and doing and, and beginning to think that actually I'm not that bad and as, as long as I live good enough, then God will be pleased with me. And of course, we've got to live in such a way that God is pleased with us. But the, the order is reversed. God gives me His righteousness because I believe in Jesus Christ. And that's the key that you will find in the book of Romans. In fact, in all of the New Testament for that matter. But especially as Paul describes it in this book, 
Uh, it is because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's because Jesus died. Jesus paid the price. Jesus brought us into the presence of God. And if, you, if I believe in Jesus, if I put my faith, my trust in Him, then God declares me righteous. And that's why the book has made such an impact because of the, the doctrine of the righteousness by faith or justification by faith as it's come to, um, to be known over church history. And so as Paul writes to a church that he's never visited up to this particular point in time, uh, he wanted to make very clear that this is the core of the gospel. It is God taking the initiative giving us what we in our own human strength will never be able to uh, inherit or to earn or to work for uh, or that we deserve. It is p purely undeserved uh, grace by God. And therefore, uh, Paul wanted those Roman Christians to know that this is the core of the gospel. And as I said, years after he became a Christian, this was still what he held on to. This is still foundational for the Apostle Paul. So let's pray together as we uh, begin this evening. Our Father, we thank you again for an opportunity to learn from your word and uh, the background, the history, and I pray as we learn more about this, your servant, the Apostle Paul, uh, and the way that you have saved him and used him, and now as we get into his letters that he wrote, uh, which became your word for us, and and tonight we accept that as your word. I pray that you would enlighten us. I pray that you would bless us. I pray, Lord, that you would increase our knowledge, but above all, that you would increase our, uh, our worship as we worship you, as we acknowledge you, uh, and as we love you because of what you have done for us. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at um, what we have done so far, um, we have looked at the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, and we have found that they uh, breathe a sort of a, a similar ethos in terms of a description of the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus. And then last time we looked at John, the Gospel of John. It's so different, the same story, but from a different angle, more specifically highlighting the divinity and the character uh, of Jesus. And then we've looked at the, the uh, story of the early church as the apostles started out, the Holy Spirit is given on the day of Pentecost, and we've gone through the story of the book of Acts, uh, which has taken us up to the end of the life of, of Paul, or the ministry of Paul as described in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, with uh, Paul two years in prison. We will continue that story uh, from little bits and pieces that we can pick up in the rest of the New Testament, but in a certain sense, we're going to go back into the book of Acts by trying to plot the different letters that Paul wrote uh, in the next few weeks. And then later on, we look at the general epistles where we will probably go beyond the life of Paul uh, and looking at um, how the New Testament uh, um, unfolds in terms of the letters written to different churches and individuals. Tonight, um, I want to do four things. I want to look at the life and the background and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Just look at the person Paul and who he was and what he's done. That's going to take us a little while to work our way through that. Briefly, I'll talk about letter writing uh, in the New Testament times uh, in the first century AD. And then we will be looking at the books of Romans and then also First and Second Corinthians. And we're going to work our way not chronologically through the letters, but actually as they occur in our New Testament. Therefore, on a timeline, you need to sort of back and forth on the timeline in terms of when they've been written. For example, Romans has been written after uh, First and Second Thessalonians, we believe. So we'll, we'll go fast forward to Romans, and then so, sometime later we'll come back to Thessalonians, and so it will, will go on pretty much like we've done with the prophets uh, in the Old Testament. I encourage you to do the reading um, in the textbooks and any other theme, in fact, there's way too much in these letters that will probably grab your attention that you want to know more about. And we really need a course, uh, almost a semester university-type course, on every single one of the letters and the books in the New Testament. 
And so my purpose here is really just to give you a very brief overview of uh, the books, the background, put them in historical context so that next time you read it, uh, you'll be more equipped uh, and have more knowledge in terms of putting those books in historical context and have at least some understanding of the message of each of those books as well. So let's look at the Apostle Paul, um, called the Apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, he himself tells us uh, that he and Peter uh, had an agreement that Peter would go to the Jews and he, Paul, would go to the Gentiles. And what I want to share with you is that uh, in God's providence, there couldn't have been a better person equipped to actually take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And as, uh, as we put the picture together, I think you'll come to uh, agree with me. Paul was born in Tarsus, not in Israel, um, and it caused him to have an openness to other nations and cultures. I think all of us have had that experience when you have uh, traveled a little bit or you've even lived in a different culture, as much as you may have experienced some culture shock uh, and so on, uh, over time it, it does bring a different perspective uh, into your life. As you are exposed to a different way of thinking, a different way of living, um, a trip to Thailand, for example, on a mission trip for me, uh, was my first taste of the East. I've traveled in some countries in Europe and in America and some African countries. But, but going to the East has, has given me a different perspective of, of the Eastern nations. And I would not uh, claim to be a, an expert in that uh, area, uh, not even by a long shot. But it did give me a bit of a better understanding of the kind of things that they grapple with and a worldview that is so different from mine. And even right here in South Africa, in our own country, we have different worldviews depending on the culture that you come from. And the fact that, especially in our country, we are exposed to so many different cultures uh, on a daily basis gives us a bit of an openness um, to other nations, other people, groups, and other languages, other worldviews as well. As difficult as it is, and we sometimes um, bang our heads a little bit with other cultures around that. But I'm, I have no doubt that the Apostle Paul had some, sometimes had difficulties with other views, the Gentile way of living and so on. But at least it gave him an openness and an understanding of those nations. He was born and raised a Jew, though. His parents were Jewish, and it gave him a great insight into and an appreciation for the Jewish culture. Um, by nature, young Jewish boys especially grew up going to the synagogue, learning um, the, the Pentateuch and the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament uh, or the Torah, and they would, they would almost grow up and part of their literacy, learning to read and write, would actually come from studying the law uh, at that particular time. And so he would have had a, a great appreciation for that. The fact that he then also trained as a, as a Jewish rabbi. Uh, he went to Jerusalem at some point in time. And there he was exposed even to a deeper study of the Jewish law uh, and the Old Testament, something that uh, comes across in his letters and his approach uh, again and again. He learned to speak Greek, uh, probably while he was growing up or in the early days in Tarsus, uh, where he was exposed to Greek philosophy uh, and Greek thinking, a Greek way of life. We called it Hellenization or Hellenism. Uh, he was definitely exposed to that as he was growing up. Uh, he was also born as a Roman citizen uh, because the city where he was born had automatic Roman citizenship uh, that, was, that was granted to the city of Tarsus and Cilicia, the province where he was, uh, where he was born, um, and Tarsus was the capital city of that uh, province. And so he, he enjoyed the privilege of Roman freedom, the Pax Romana as we called it earlier on, and uh, some protection whenever he needed that. Again, we pick that up in the book of Acts uh, quite uh, often. And then dramatically saved by God on the road to Damascus. And that really changed his life around. But it didn't wipe out his history. So the fact that he was a Jew, he could speak Greek, he had Roman citizenship, and he understood Judaism, all of those things he retained. But in addition to all of that, he became a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. And that all of these things put together really equipped him very, very well to become the apostle to the Gentiles. I just want to go back and look at each one of the major characteristics of the apostle Paul, just to reiterate the fact that he was so well equipped. Uh, 
I mentioned this uh, several times in the preparation of the New Testament times. As you go back into what is known as the intertestamental period, um, many times we think that God may not have actively done something. But as I have pointed out again and again, God was pre busy preparing the world for the coming of Jesus. In uh, the fact that Greek was the language, the Jews were spread around the world, the Roman roads, and, and all those things prepared the world for Jesus, and the coming of the gospel, and the spreading of the gospel around the world. In a, in a more miniature version of that, one could, you, you can almost see the same thing happening here, but in the life of one single individual, and that is in the life of the Apostle Paul. Because God was busy preparing Paul for what he, God knew, only God knew, was going to come somewhere uh, in the future. Paul was thoroughly Jewish. Um, he again and again claims that he's never turned his back on his own people. In the book of Philippians... Paul actually, uh, defending himself, explains to the Philippians uh, the, uh, the value that he, that he held or the beliefs that he held in terms of a Jew, of being a Jew. Now, obviously, there's a context here where he's defending himself and he's talking about who he was. And, and there are other Jews who are Christians who say to the Philippian Gentiles that you have to be circumcised. In other words, you really need to become a Jew in order to become a Christian or to be a good Christian. And Paul, as we saw last week, had a major battle over that whole issue. And that ended up in the uh, Jerusalem Council, which, was, uh, which is described for us in Acts chapter 15. Um, but, but in his argument, Paul says basically to the Philippians, now, if that is really what I wanted to do, if these people are right, that you have to be circumcised, you have to become a Jew, let, let me just tell you where I'm coming from. And in describing that, you find how thoroughly Jewish this uh, person was. He says, um, if anyone thinks, in uh, chapter 3, verse 4, if anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, and that is what he's saying. Circumcision uh, are the things I do. In other words, I have confidence in the flesh. That gives me the right to approach God. He says, if anyone else thinks that he's got this confidence, let, let me prove to you that I could have argued that way if I wanted to. And then he says, I have, I have more. I've been circumcised on the eighth day. Now, that's a pride, a very, sorry, not a pride, but a proud Jew speaking. Because not all Jewish boys were necessarily circumcised on the eighth day. That was what the law stated. But because of circumstances often, it wasn't always possible for parents to be at a place where the boy can be circumcised on the eighth day. In fact, the term actually that is used is an eighth dayer. I am an eighth dayer. Now, that, that gives me a certain sense of pride. Uh, and so Paul says, you want to brag? I can brag because I'm an eighth dayer. He says, I, I was of the people of Israel, that links him to Abraham all the way back, of the tribe of Benjamin. The first king came from the tribe of Benjamin. He was Saul, and Paul inherited his name, Saul. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's the name that, um, that Isra the Israelites started picking up over years. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. Now, even just saying that, uh, you're saying, well, the Pharisees regard ourselves as a little step higher than any other party, any other religious party, because we were meticulous in keeping the law. And he then says, as for zeal, persecuting the church. It wasn't as if um, I, I was a Christian from the start. In fact, if you want to push my button, I was there to persecute the church, to bring those Christians to the, to the fore and have them persecuted and killed and so on. And so, really, I was a Jew because I was defending Judaism. And as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Uh, like any Pharisee would say, uh, I was faultless. Now, this is a proper, proud Jew speaking, saying, I had it all. I was a Jew to the bone, to the core of my being. And yet, God came in, and this is what he says in the next verse. I'm not going to continue expounding that, but he says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of of Christ. So all those things meant absolutely zero. He actually says, I consider them rubbish for the purpose of receiving Christ my Lord. Uh, and I'm um, not quoting it directly. Paul would have known Hebrew. Uh, 
um, because he would have been able to read the Hebrew scriptures, um, but he obviously also probably learned to speak Aramaic, uh, which was maybe his home language, uh, or perhaps Greek was his home language. We're not entirely certain about that. He was committed to the Jews. When he argues around the position of Israel in Romans chapter, chapters 9, 10, and 11, he actually says, I have not turned my back uh, on my own people. And perhaps we just need to, to read that in Romans chapter 9, verse 2. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises, the patriarchs, and he goes on. So, again, Paul says, I've never turned my back on my people. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about that, and, and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. He understood the law, its implications, and uh, he was therefore the ideal person to reinterpret the Old Testament in the light of the coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came into this world, he fulfilled the, uh, the law and the prophets in the Old Testament and what God was busy doing, and he, he was the next step in a certain sense of what God was doing in this world. And Paul was ideally suited, given his Jewish background, to reinterpret the Old Testament. It's the reason why Paul was able to go to different cities around the known world at the time, around the Mediterranean, enter, entering into the synagogues. Um, most people would have recognized him, or at least he would have induced himself as a Jewish rabbi. He was. He was trained as a, as a Jewish rabbi. He was then able to open up the Old Testament and read from it. And it was only then that he would then go and say, now let me tell you this has been fulfilled and let me tell you about Jesus Christ. And then of course some Jews accepted and others rejected and oftentimes Paul was persecuted because in his mind the logic went from Old Testament to New Testament and the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's where the Jews had difficulty and they were at loggerheads and, and he was then oftentimes chased out of either the synagogue or even uh, out of some of those cities. Paul was also a Greek. There is every indication in the letters of Paul that he had a good command of Greek. He may have used a scribe to write some of the material. We actually have evidence of that. But uh, every now and again, he would come to the end of the letter and he'd say, this is my own handwriting. This is the way I write. Maybe he had an ugly handwriting or something, uh, but it's almost like a signature on, on the letters. But there's any, every indication that he had a good knowledge of Greek, also of Greek philosophy. And when he was in uh, Athens, um, he actually stood up and in a speech that is very different from the normal one because he wasn't speaking to Jews, he was actually speaking to a Greek audience where they uh, were very, very impressed with Greek philosophy and they philosophized and uh, theorized. Um, this is what they did on a daily basis and they asked him to come and address them. And he took a very different line. And one of the things he did was to actually quote some of their own philosophers, uh, which then revealed the fact that Paul, even in just uh, unprepared speech, he was able to uh, quote some of the own, their own Greek uh, philosophers. He may have made use of a, of a scribe, as I said, uh, from time to time, uh, but there is um, all, every, every indication that he was able to, to speak Greek and to write Greek, and that opened up a, a huge world for him, with Greek being the spoken language of the day. But we also need to understand Paul is a Roman. He received citizenship by birth, as I said before, uh, being born in Tarsus. His citizenship provided him with rights and protection. It gave him the right to travel, the freedom to travel, the safety to travel. And right at the end, um, and several times during his stay, he insisted on being a Roman citizen. Uh, in Philippi, for example, he was in prison. And then the, the authorities the next day told the uh, prison guard to let them go. And he said, no, we are Roman citizens and we insist on being led out of the prison. In other words, you're not going to behind um, the scene or in secret let us, let us slip away. Uh, we want sort of almost, he didn't say it in so many words, but almost a public apology. And uh, when the authorities heard that they were Roman citizens, then they, they had a bit of a fright and they actually came and, and pleaded with them to leave in peace, please, sort of thing. Now, Paul used that same uh, right again and again. And right at the end, when he was on trial in Caesarea, 
uh, when he saw that things were going nowhere after two years, uh, he appealed to the, to, the, uh, to the emperor, and he had the right to do it, and the right was given to him, was, was granted him. And that's why he ended up in a ship, and he was shipped off to, uh, to Rome to, be, to appear before uh, the emperor. But of course, as I said before, we will never understand Paul unless we understand him as a Christian. His conversion to Christ is described in Acts chapter 9 uh, as a dramatic and personal encounter. He was on his, en route to go and persecute the Christians in, in Damascus and Syria. And en route there, um, there was a bright light and Jesus met with him, spoke to him. He was blinded for a few days. He, was even, he, couldn't, he wasn't able to see. <clears throat> he was fasting and, and not eating. And then a, a disciple, a Christian disciple by the name of Ananias came laid his hand on Paul, <clears throat> and he was able to see the, the way was then explained to him more clearly. He was baptized, and immediately uh, he became a missionary. Started to preach to the point where Jews in Damascus wanted to kill him. Uh, they plotted to kill him, and he was left, led down with a basket from the, the city wall, and he was able to escape from there. But he received a unique revelation from, uh, from Jesus Christ. Now, he describes a bit of that, although it's a, it's a mystery. Most of that is a mystery to us. He doesn't give us um, much detail. But again, in defense of his own ministry, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now, uh, a, bit, a quick a word of explanation here. Uh, when, when, you, when you want to brag about yourself, you say, I, Gerard Venter, uh, was caught up in heaven and I saw and met Jesus Christ. But that sounds like boasting. And so in, in the language in those days, and, and sometimes preachers will still do it till today, um, but they would use the third person in referring to themselves. So, uh, all scholars, most scholars agree that this man whom Paul knows is himself. But in humility, he doesn't say, I, Paul, went to heaven sort of thing. He actually describes the event uh, in the third person, which is why it's such strange language. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. In other words, this is real. I have actually had that revelation. And um, he goes on, but I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say uh, or do. When you put that sort of direct reference, direct, indirect reference in the third person, together with bits and pieces that Paul talks in other places where he writes in other places, as well as the story of Acts chapter 9, it becomes clear that Paul had a very dramatic, not only conversion, but also seems to have had uh, some direct encounter and revelation from Jesus Christ, um, where he was able to speak and write with authority as someone who knew Christ. His radical transformation became almost like an exodus for him, it's like a turnaround. Uh, and and this, this conversion, uh, he talks about several times in the book of Acts. He actually tells the story on several occasions uh, how he came to know Christ. Um, and it was uh, Paul who was then able to come to grips with the radical demands of Christianity and the implications of the gospel. I think the radical conversion really helped him. Uh, I mean, he was going in one particular direction. Jesus stepped into his life, and he, he made a 180-degree turn, and he was going the opposite direction, from persecuting the Christians to becoming a persecuted Christian. That is as radical as you can ever find it. Uh, and it was for this reason that he was so well equipped uh, in taking the gospel uh, to the nations. Now, Paul the Apostle is another characteristic of Paul that we need to understand. The term apostle from the Greek word apostello, uh, to send, it's, it's literally just I send, that's what the word actually means. 
initially referred to those who were sent out by the Lord. Uh, we are told in the Gospels that Jesus prayed uh, one night and then he, out of the group of many disciples, he selected 12 and he called them apostles. In other words, people who are sent by God or sent by Jesus Christ. Um, and although the term is simply to be sent, it became a very technical term to refer to those early 12 apostles. To the point where in Acts chapter 1, when Judas by this time is dead, he betrayed Jesus and he died, Peter stood up and said, we need to find a replacement, we need to be 12. There's significance in the number 12, 12 tribes, uh, 12 apostles. When you go to the book of Revelation, um, and hopefully we'll get there sometime later, uh, you also get the, the number 24, which is representative of a combination of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. You combine them and you have 24 elders uh, before the throne. And so it's a significant number, um, and it's a symbolic number as well, and Jesus selected those 12. But it is true that um, later on, uh, the term was expanded slightly to include people who have not been with Jesus. Now, we have some of the sort of requirements, if you wish, in that event that I referred to already in Acts chapter 1. When Peter stood up and said that we need to find a replacement, um, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So you have to have been with Jesus all the time, so it must be in that circle of, of wider disciples with Jesus at the time. And then also this person needs to become a witness of the things that we have seen, being with Jesus and being a witness of his resurrection. And as I said, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that term was expanded slightly, and we're not told how and when. But somehow, the Apostle Paul, or Paul, became an apostle. Barnabas and, and a few others seem to have been included in that. Um, most evangelical scholars today will believe that the role and the position of the apostle has ceased as a position, as a title. Now, it's not true for everyone, because even around the world today, you will have... Um, churches where they will still continue to call the leader an apostle uh, and uh, there are churches where they even have 12 apostles around the world and when one dies they would replace it with another one and so on. But most uh, evangelical scholars as I said uh, believe that as a position it no longer exists but perhaps one can look at an apostolic type ministry something like the apostle Paul who was able to go around, plant churches, and with some authority have some kind of a say or input in a local church or several local churches as well. Uh, church history has taught us that the church burned its fingers with uh, the possibility of certain people rising to a position of apostles around the world. And uh, we just don't believe that that is a, a healthy way of going about it anymore. But the New Testament doesn't tell us exactly when apostles cease to exist as a position or as a title. Now, one of the questions you may ask yourself, and you may have heard preachers preach about this, uh, and that is when Saul became Paul. And I've heard this actually say many times. On the road to Damascus, Jesus came into the life of Paul, uh, into the life of Saul, and changed his name to Paul, and he was a new person after that. Is that actually true? Well, not really. The Bible doesn't say that at all. Most people wrongly assume that, that his name was changed from Saul to Paul when he became a Christian. And uh, nothing can be further from the truth. In Acts chapter 9, he is Saul, and he's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus comes into his life. And for several chapters after that, the word Paul never even occurs in the book of Acts. And it's only in Acts chapter 13 when Paul is on his first missionary journey, and as we will look at the chronology of Paul in a moment, you'll see that we're now talking probably uh, 12 or 14 years later, and Paul is in the presence of a Roman proconsul who has the name Paul, in Greek, Ho Paulos, and that's how, the way you pronounce that. And 
and this man was Paulos, and right there at that point, the, the author, whom we believe to be Luke, as we have seen, changes and says, Saul, who is also known as Paul, and then from that point on, it's Paul, and never Saul again, ever. And so it's an interesting shift. And what is happening is that Saul was probably given the name Saul as a Hebrew name or an Aramaic name, and he was named after King Saul, as I said before. But being in a, in a, a Greek or a foreign or Gentile environment in Tarsus, he also was given a name that was maybe easier on the tongue. It's not an uncommon thing. Here in South Africa, many of our, our black people, for example, have a Kosa, Zulu, Sutu, or whatever other name. Sometimes a bit of a tongue twister for my uh, Afrikaans tongue. And um, so more often than not, they adopt what has become known as a Western name. It's Peter or John or Paul or whatever, many of them actually being biblical names. And so it was a very common practice in those days to give two names to your children, especially if you are in a foreign environment, like Paul grew up in a foreign environment. So he had two names all the time anyway. And so at this particular point in time, beginning to realize probably that God has sent him on a mission to the Gentiles, he started adopting and using, not just adopting, but actually using a name that he already had. And that's the Gentile name, if you wish, the Greek name, which is Paul Paolo. So that is a, 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 an explanation of when Saul actually, or how Saul became Paul. In terms of birth and upbringing, his date of birth is unknown to us. It may have been around 5 AD, uh, which then would make him uh, junior to Jesus in terms of age. Uh, again, we're not, we're not exactly sure because Paul doesn't really talk about his own birth uh, in terms of dating it. He was born in Tarsus. We said that already. Um, it, it's modern-day Turkey, uh, and it was in a province called Cilicia uh, at the time. It was a well-known city boasting a Greek university, Stoic thinking, philosophy, Greek thinking and philosophy, in other words. He was named Saul after the first king, and then later on started using his Greek name, Paul. Uh, on this map, um, and, and we, we may look at other maps as well, with Jerusalem down here, Damascus and Syria, where he was on his way to... Uh, go and persecute the Christians or try and take them prisoner. And Tarsus uh, is on the lower side, let's call it um, south-central uh, Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Um, and this whole region was divided up into many different Roman provinces. And uh, as Paul started traveling, many of the cities that are, that are mentioned are here in Asia Minor, was Asia Minor uh, on the uh, sort of western side of that map. Tarsus is a historical city in south-central Turkey, 20 kilometers inland from the Mediterranean. It's part of the adana mersin metropolitan area, that's modern-day area, and the fourth largest metropolitan area in Turkey with a population of uh, probably now approaching about 3 million people. It has a history going back 9,000 years um, and many different other things. And this uh, is the scene of the first meeting between Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and then um, also... Uh, was a Roman province and um, the place where Paul was born in the city of Tarsus. And on the photo, there's a, uh, it's not a very old, relatively speaking, not a very old Roman bridge, but it's still a Roman road uh, that is still in existence from uh, several hundred years into Christianity. Uh, during the time of Pompey in 67 BC, Tarsus was made capital over the Roman province of Cilicia, and Jews began to receive Roman citizenship. Antony, who controlled the eastern provinces, declared the city free. A Roman gave it Roman freedom in 42 BC. Tarsus continued to receive special privileges under Augustus and uh, several others as well. And you can read the rest of that from BiblePlaces.com. Paul's education included growing up in Tarsus, going to school probably, or being trained by his parents, as well as maybe in the local synagogue, and he was then moved to, uh, or he was sent to, or he moved to Jerusalem to be educated in Jewish law. Uh, we, we're not sure when that happened. Uh, normally, boys would be in their teens when they go and study under the leadership of a rabbi in order to themselves become rabbis. And by about the age of 30 or so, they would then become more public figures, and then they would start gathering their own disciples and teaching uh, and, and so forth. 
We're not sure why that happened, whether it was his parents' dream for him or whether Paul had a sense of calling to become a rabbi. Ultimately, of course, we have to say that God was uh, behind it. He studied under Gamaliel I, and he himself tells us about that, uh, trained to become a rabbi, had an excellent knowledge of the Old Testament, uh, and although he was able probably to read the, the, the Hebrew um, and, and spoke uh, Aramaic as well, uh, the quotes that we have, which is fairly logical, are uh, all in the New Testament come from the Septuagint, which is uh, abbreviated LXX, or the Greek translation uh, of the Old Testament. We don't know whether Paul actually saw Jesus. This, this is an interesting debate or a question. Now, let's say Paul was in his early teens, uh, or late teens even, when he went to Jerusalem. Um, Jesus would not at that time have started his public ministry yet. So, uh, whether Paul just never bounced into Jesus, as it were, uh, now living in Jerusalem, studying under Gamaliel, and Jesus doing most of what he did in, in, in Galilee, and then eventually coming down to Jerusalem, it is, a, it is a question as to whether Paul actually physically saw or met Jesus or even saw him at a distance and he obviously must have heard about the story of Jesus. There is one and only literally one reference that could be uh, alluding to this particular fact, but we're not, again, we're not 100% certain. And Paul says something like um, Jesus in, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Verse 15, Jesus died for all, and those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them was raised again. So from now on, we, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Um, and there's an interesting uh, translation of that in the King James, which says we, we knew him in, a, in the flesh or something like that or in a fleshly way, or a worldly way, which is more correct than the NIV. question is, is Paul here referring to perhaps having met Jesus, seeing Him, and was actually over the moon when He was crucified because He hated this man? We're not sure, because Paul doesn't actually tell us. Here's just one brief little reference that may refer to the fact that Paul was around in Jerusalem when Jesus died. Otherwise, it puts Paul in terms of his training as a rabbi, and he may have been moving up and down uh, between Tarsus and Jerusalem, and maybe for those few years that Jesus ministered publicly, and when he died, Paul was maybe not in Jerusalem. Uh, we cannot be emphatic on the, those kinds of, of details. When we talk about dating the Apostle Paul and his ministry, there are two approaches to chronology. I can tell you um, that I, was, I grew up in Kimberley, and when I started grade 10, my parents moved to Brackpan. I matriculated in Brackpan. Um, I then studied for four years. I went to the army for a year. Um, and then I studied some more. And I was in ministry for seven years uh, in Florida on the West Rand. Another seven years in East London. Another 14 years in Cape Town. And so on. All of those things are relative. You can work out uh, roughly... When a, person is, when a person matriculates, he's been in school for 12 years. Yeah, that's if you pass everything. You have been in school for 12 years. And then you study for four years. And then you add another seven years of ministry or another year here. Uh, and another 14 years there, etc., etc. All of those things are relative. But the moment I say to you, and I'll give my age away, I matriculated in 1972. You no longer talk relative chronology, you talk about actual chronology. Because now you can fix the date. So, when we look at all the details we have in the book of Acts, we put it together with the bits and pieces of information that you pick up in the letters, and more specifically where Paul actually gives us a bit of a, a history lesson on himself in Galatians chapter 1. Again, in defense of his own ministry, and de describing his own ministry. We, we are able to put together the slide that I gave you last week, and that is um, Paul was saved. He, he disappeared for a little bit. He occurred again in Acts chapter 13 in Antioch and Syria. Uh, from there, he went on his first missionary journey 
lasted about a year, maybe less than a year. He went to Jerusalem for the council. Then he went on his second missionary journey. You add it all up. You find X number of years, third missionary journey. Two years in Caesarea, two years in Rome. You have a relative chronology. The question is, can we fix the date? Well, the beauty of this is we actually can. We have an actual chronology uh, for the Apostle Paul. And, and that comes from what has become known as the Gallio inscription that was discovered in 1905 in which Caesar Claudius refers to Gallio, who is the governor of Achaia. And the city of Corinth is in, um, in that region, or that whole region was called Achaia, uh, and Gallio was the proconsul probably from the 1st of June 51 to the 1st of June 52 AD. And in the book of Acts chapter 18, the, Paul is in Corinth. He's in the city of Corinth. And the people have a bit of an uprising. Um, and they bring Paul uh, before the proconsul, the, the local proconsul. And his name is Gallio. And so we're able to fix that. And in Acts chapter 18, verse 12, uh, maybe just uh, before that, um, in verse 11, Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them, that's the people in Corinth, the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Paul was about to speak and then Gallio said, look, this is a Jewish thing. Uh, I don't want to hear from you. Uh, leave here. And, and he left Paul alone. But the reality is that we actually now have a fixed date. And in the, Romans, in the Roman system, a person was never appointed longer than 12 months in a particular place to be a proconsul. And that's just purely uh, historical and archaeological uh, information. That means uh, that we can fix the Apostle Paul being in the city of Corinth in the year 51, June 51 to June 52, somewhere around there. Once you've got that fixed date, then you can work your, your way both sides, uh, both ways rather, in trying to establish a particular chronology, an actual chronology for the Apostle Paul. Achaia is this region, as I said, it's modern day Greece, and there is Athens over there, there is Corinth um, right there, and this is where we find uh, the Apostle Paul. Achaia refers to an area before the Roman conquest in 146, a strip of land between the Gulf of Corinth in the north and Elis and Arcadia in the south, embracing 12 cities leagued together. Um, and then you can read the rest of that. When we go to the book of Acts, um, it is very clear that Paul was a persecutor of the Christians. Chapter 8, verse 1 says that clearly. Chapter 9, the first two verses tell us that he was on his way to Damascus to uh, take some of the Christians prisoner and even try and kill them. He was converted to Christ in chapter 9. His initial ministry in Damascus happened um, in chapter 9 or described in chapter 9. From that point on, things blur completely. Paul is let down the wall. He then goes to Jerusalem, but we're not sure whether he went directly straight to Jerusalem or whether he went elsewhere and then later came back. Because that's what Paul says in Galatians. He said, I didn't go to Jerusalem immediately. I didn't even talk to the apostles yet. It was only later. Although Acts tells us that somehow Paul did go to Jerusalem, and it was Barnabas who had to really calm down the apostles because they were afraid of Paul. He was the persecutor. And it was Barnabas who took him in and introduced him to the apostles. But there's a time in the life of Paul that is missing for us. He doesn't describe that. He just went to Arabia, he said. The ministry at Antioch, we find in chapter 11, that's when uh, the, some Gentiles now became Christians. They formed the first Gentile church, and um, the apostles sent Barnabas. Barnabas saw that this was a massive task. He goes to Tarsus, where Paul was at that particular point in time, finds him. He brings him to Antioch, and the two of them with several others minister together, and that's where the missionary journeys kick in, in chapter 13. And last week we looked at that. From that point on, it's all about the different, um, minist the different uh, uh, journeys of the uh, missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. His name changes in chapter 13, verse 9, for the first time. Uh, he's arrested and he journeys to Rome, chapters 21 all the way to 28. That's the latter part of his life. And the book of Acts concludes with Paul in prison, as we saw uh, last week, where ultimately 
if we believe uh, early church uh, tradition. He was released. He traveled a few years more, maybe a couple more. He ended up back in prison in Rome where he was executed by Emperor Nero. And so here is a summary of Paul's chronology. And I will show you this particular slide several times in the weeks to come uh, because we need to try and hold on to the letters and, and where those letters fit in. Not that that is ultimately the most important thing, but it provides us with some wonderful background. Um, and then if we look at this summary of the chronology, he may, he may have been born uh, plus minus 5 AD in Tarsus. By about 34, uh, give and take two years perhaps, depending on when Jesus was crucified, um, but a few years after Jesus, maybe a couple of years after Jesus was crucified, Paul became a Christian. His first visit to Jerusalem, if we put the, the figures and the facts together, he may have gone to Jerusalem on a brief visit, but may or may not have actually been with the church there, and he was off. And you can imagine when word got to Jerusalem that those uh, Jewish leaders who had it in for the Christians certainly would have looked for Paul to kill him if they could only lay their hands on him. So he didn't stay in Jerusalem, but we then pick him up again uh, roughly 12 years later uh, when, when we find him uh, in Antioch and then the first missionary journey happens in the year 47. By the year 49, uh, we have the Jerusalem Council described in Acts chapter 15, and then in the years 49 to 52, the second missionary journey, and then it's 51 and 52 that we have the contact with Gallia. And that is where we can plot him uh, on, a, uh, on a table, on, a, on a, a timeline. The third missionary journey took several years, 52 to 57 perhaps. It was a much longer journey, uh, back and forth all over. And then uh, 57 to 64, uh, he is in Jerusalem, in Caesarea, and then ultimately in Rome. And that is in 64. Add another two years or so. By 66, that's not described in the Bible, and we have him back in Rome where he died. All right, that brings us to the letters and the epistles. Uh, we're, we're now starting our journey down that, um, that road of looking at the epistles in the New Testament. And just by way of a general introduction, in terms of writing in the first century, it was not an uncommon thing. Uh, it was a well-known form of communication uh, there are hundreds and thousands and thousands of manuscripts and little bits and pieces uh, discovered through archaeological means everywhere around the known world at the time. People wrote. They, they didn't necessarily write books like we would have it today, and certainly publishing was not as well known uh, back then, but certainly they wrote uh, documents, uh, receipts, and uh, letters that people wrote to one another. All of those are examples around, uh, and certainly our examples in the New Testament are not particularly unique. It's unique in terms of being the Word of God, but as, as a form of, of communication, that was not uh, unique. Letter writing. If you wrote a letter, you wouldn't start like we would do today, uh, Dear Joan, um, uh, how are things going with you? Things are going well with me. Uh, and then you write a little bit about what you want to write, and then right at the end, so you write a four-page letter to your wife, uh, and she uh, is not exactly sure whether it's you writing, so she needs to go to the end of the letter to see if it's really you. That's where you put your name, dear, not dear Joan, and then right at the end, your sincerely or your loving husband or your whatever it is, and then my name. Uh, it was very different in the ancient world in the first century. You started with your name. This is Gerard writing to Joan. <clears throat> and that's exactly how it happened in those days, and that's the, the precise form that we have in the letters in the New Testament. So the name, you identify yourself, from whom, and you then identify the receiver of the letter, um, uh, to whom you wrote. Then there's a greeting. I hope things are well with you, um, and some well wishes to the reader, the person who's receiving the letter. Then stating the purpose, why am I writing to you? I'm writing to you because I would like to come and visit you. Or I forgot my coat there, or whatever. That's the purpose of the letter. Then there's the body of the letter where you expand and explain maybe a few little things. And then at the end, this is the way you end your letter. You know, so-and-so is with me and he or she sends his or her greetings. And I also would like for you to greet so-and-so who is with you. And that's it. No more name, no more your own name or the reader's name. 
So you end with some greetings. Now, if you go to the New Testament, that is the style of letter writing that we find. And that's exactly what Paul did. Author, I, Paul, write. We, we actually read that in Romans. And, um, and we'll see that again and again. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, and he, he uses six verses to introduce himself, and then in verse 7, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And then a greeting, um, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there is a purpose, and he actually, we've, we've looked at that purpose earlier on, and then in the end, in the conclusion, and we're going to look at that in detail later on, not, not the detail of that, but uh, some, some uh, discussion around chapter 13, uh, uh, chapter 16 rather, where Paul greets uh, several people in the city of Rome, and th that's the way he ends his book. He uses the conventional style uh, in writing, but he gives it, uh, Christian contents. There's just um, one quick example of that, and you will hear this even in the wording or in the sound. Uh, the normal greeting would be charein, and that is, I greet you, or uh, you are to be greeted, or whatever. The word is charein. But then Paul, instead of saying, I greet you, he would say, the grace of the Lord, and the word is charis. So you can see from charein, it became charis. And um, you can even hear the same sound, but he gave it Christian contents rather than just following uh, the normal uh, secular form of letters, uh, letter writing. There are a total of 21 letters in the New Testament. We believe that 13 of them came from the Apostle Paul. In terms of the order of those letters, they are not according to date. They're not certainly not according to uh, importance. They seem to be collected around the author. In this particular case, Paul, 13 of those letters. Then we have the general letters. Now, of course, when you have three from them, three letters coming from John, um, the New Testament, um, those who put it together, obviously group them together. Not that they are the same stage or the same age, but it's to group them together. And then in terms of the order of the Apostle Paul's, they seem to be in length rather than in importance. And certainly not, as I said before, not in terms of date. When we classify those letters, as we, as we journey through these letters, you need to sort of hold on to this overall picture. Paul's epistles, 13 of them, sometimes also called the Pauline or Pauline, whichever pronunciation you prefer, Pauline corpus. Uh, he wrote to nine churches altogether, and that includes Romans, Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, Thessal Thessalonians, and then also uh, to four individuals. Philemon, 1st and 2nd Timothy, or actually just three individuals, but, but four letters addressed to individuals, uh, Timothy and then also Titus. We also sometimes classify prison letters. We'll look at that next week. Some of the letters have been written, obviously, from a prison. And oftentimes scholars refer to the prison letters of the Apostle Paul. And the 1st uh, and 2nd Timothy and Titus are called pastoral letters because it's one pastor writing to another pastor. And so they are sometimes classified as that. Then we have the general epistles. There are eight of them. They are general since they're not written to a specific person or church, uh, by and large. And we have Hebrews. In the case of Hebrews, we don't know who the author is. 1st and 2nd Peter um, and the three letters of John and James and Jude, and they are very general in terms of the audience. We don't know to whom they are written. Very different from the Apostle Paul, where Paul says, I, Paul, write to you, the Romans, or the Corinthians, or whatever. Uh, these letters do not have an addressee, uh, per se. When we look at the, uh, the geographical spread on this particular slide, um, with Israel down here, there's Ephesus and Colossae, Galatia is a region, not a city, but a, but a region. A region. Uh, Philippi in Macedonia, Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, Thessalonica, and then Corinth over there. That is roughly the geographical spread. And then, of course, there's Rome of the letters of the Apostle Paul. He wrote more than what we have in our Bible. There is no doubt, uh, as you go through the detail, you will find that very quickly, that Paul wrote not only these, but we, the others are lost to us. For some reason, the church just never uh, kept them. And so with that, we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we'll uh, look at the book of Romans, and then also at First and Second Corinthians. <music>
All right, we're going to look at the book of Romans, and I would call this book or this letter a theological reflection. Paul's epistle to the Romans um, has made a lasting impact on church history and also the history of humanity, of the world, especially the Western world. During and after the Reformation in the 16th century, this book literally changed the course of history. I've mentioned this already before, but as Martin Luther was reading the book of Romans, he came to an understanding of what has become known as justification by faith. This is the matter that he took up with the church, the, Ro the Roman Catholic Church at the time, and uh, cut a long story short, which we don't have time to go into, it led to the, what today is known as the Protestant uh, movement around the world with millions and millions of people uh, who are influenced, have been and are influenced by uh, the message of the book of Romans. Uh, it has impacted people like Augustine uh, or Augustine, some people um, pronounce that, Wesley, John Wesley, uh, many, many others. Uh, it has also been the source of many studies. As I said, this is one book where you probably need two semesters a whole year uh, just to go through the book and to study it in detail. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, who passed away or died in 1981, uh, preached more than 350 sermons from the book of Romans. And uh, the volumes that were published after that consist of 14, and they are not small little volumes, but 14 volumes just on the book of Romans. And so it's, a, uh, it is, it's an endless book in terms of the depth and what you can discover and what God has been doing uh, in and through uh, this particular letter. city of Rome had achieved a grandeur befitting the capital of an empire dominating the world of the Mediterranean. It was at that time, or at the time, the largest city in the world, and probably the largest city ever built until the 19th century. Uh, people have different estimates in terms of the evidence before us uh, from an archaeological point of view, but it ranges from about half a million to three and a half million. Uh, many people would sort of settle somewhere between one and two million people at that particular time, living in and around uh, the city of Rome. This grandeur increased under Augustus, Caesar Augustus, who completed Caesar's projects and added many of his own, such as the Forum of Augustus, the uh, Ara Passis. Um, he is said to have remarked that he found Rome a city of brick and he left a city of marble. The great fire of Rome during the reign of Nero left much of the city destroyed, but in many ways it was used as an excuse for new development. Um, I love uh, the books of Asterix, for example, um, and some of the little drawings and pictures there is of a very neat and tidy city. It's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not uncommon. It wasn't uncommon to the Romans, and obviously when they were so meticulous in the, in the way that they built their roads and their uh, organizations and everything else, you could, you could imagine how they would have spent some money and time in making sure their capital city uh, reflected something of this grandeur. When it comes to the church in Rome, um, it was planted not by any of the known apostles, as far as we know. My personal view, uh, which I can't prove at all, is that on the day of Pentecost, there were people, and we have then the uh, name Rome, or people from Rome mentioned Jews who came to Jerusalem to worship during the feast. And they heard the gospel, and many of those people mentioned in Acts chapter 2 went back to their own cities and countries where they lived and where they grew up, uh, Jews in dispersion. And uh, I personally have a suspicion that uh, this is really the origin of the church in Rome, that some of those people were in Jerusalem at the time, and they then went back to, to Rome, and that's how they started it. The one thing we do know is that Paul did not start this church. He actually writes to a church that he's not, not planted, um, and he is writing to them to prepare the way to visit them uh, for the first time. The impression is created in the letter to the Romans that it consisted mostly of Gentile Christians, but there was a mix of those with Gentile and Jewish people living in the city of Rome. At one stage, um, the Jews were excommunicated from the city, uh, and they left. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila were among those. Uh, we read in the book of Acts they were uh, expelled from the city of Rome, but over time many of them went back to Rome once again. So there were many Jews in the city as well, 
um, but it, we get the impression that the the core of the uh, church, uh, by and large, was uh, Gentile. And again, we have no real proof uh, of that. Paul's relationship with Rome, uh, we, we conclude that he didn't plant the church. He, he says in the first introductory part that he had planned to go to Rome several times, but he's never had that opportunity. But he's now actually planning towards the end of his third missionary journey. He's planning to go there at some point in time. Chapter 15 Verse 23, but now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions and is somewhere uh, in the east, uh, and since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company uh, for a while. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. And Paul is talking about his plan to go to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey where he ended up going, but then he was arrested. And his own plan to go as a free man to Rome never materialized, but he did end up in Rome, but then, of course, as a prisoner. Paul wrote to the Roman church to prepare um, the way for his own planned visit. And then in the verse I just read, uh, in verse 24, he says, I would like for you to assist me to go to Spain. So Paul in his mind was on his way west. He was going to West Europe, Western Europe, to go and preach uh, the gospel. And, and that really gives us the occasion for the purpose for the writing of the letter. In terms of the occasion of writing the letter to the Romans, Paul wrote approximately 57 AD. Uh, if you go back to the chronology, you will see that that is really towards the end of his third missionary journey, just before he left for Jerusalem, it seems like. Uh, he is probably in Corinth in Acts chapter 20. We read about Paul wintering in Corinth, in the city of Corinth. He has a bit of time on his hands. Uh, he's in a sort of, a, if you wish, a regular uh, ministry where he has a bit of time on his hands and he's, he's thinking through three long uh, missionary journeys and many, many years of activity in uh, Syria and also in Asia Minor and in Cilicia and Galatia and those places, modern day Turkey, where he traveled and where he ministered mostly. Uh, and he's thinking about where the Lord may be leading him next. And as I said, he's thinking going to Spain. But since he's got a bit of time on his hand and the, the ministry in those regions finished or completed, obviously never, never really completed, but in his mind he's done enough there. He was looking for new territories to go and uh, where he could go and share the gospel. That also meant that he had time for reflection. And I find the book of Romans actually the best and well thought through, almost reading like a theological treatise, where Paul systematically explains the gospel, explains how Christian, not Christians, how Jews and Gentiles are both lost, how humanity is lost, and how God through His own, by His own grace, sent Jesus into the world, and that by believing and trusting in Jesus, people can be saved. Then he talks about the implications of being saved, as he goes on in the book. And then ultimately, uh, he, he writes practically uh, to the Romans to prepare the way for His own coming, and to assist Him to go to Spain. Paul may have heard that uh, the false teachings that he encountered in every one of his uh, missionary journeys, resulting in the council in Jerusalem uh, in 49 AD, uh, he probably heard that uh, the, the same false teachings have reached places like Rome and others. Many of his letters are actually around that particular issue, helping people to get back to the truth and to resist the false teachings that are going around. And so this may be the, the other reason why Paul is writing to the Romans, to give them a very good, proper grounding and a solid teaching uh, as to uh, the meaning of the gospel. Let me give you a broad outline of the book of Romans. We, we just don't have time to go into the details of the book, but in the first 15 verses we have Paul introducing himself, greeting the Roman church, and then some general comments about his desire to see them. And then... We've read it earlier on, but uh, verses 16 and 17 really give us the theme of the letter. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in it is the power of God to bring salvation. And uh, that almost sums up the ministry of Paul. I'm not ashamed 
of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And Paul has seen it. Uh, I'm still amazed that at the end of all of those journeys, after all the persecution even, he still holds on and he still says Jesus is the way. Um, and, and the gospel, the fact that Jesus came and died, this is the power of, of God. I've seen it. Jews have come to know God. Gentiles have come to know God through, through Jesus Christ and through the preaching uh, of this gospel message. Then in chapters 1 and 2, the rest of chapter 1 and, and uh, chapter 2, he talks about sin, the sin and lostness of humankind. Uh, he is at pains to point out how Gentiles are in sin. But just in case the Jew, you Jew, he says, just in case you think you are uh, off the hook, um, you are also as lost as anybody else. We're all lost. In fact, all of humanity is lost. And that's the point that he's making in chapters 1 and 2. And then in chapter 3, he goes on to talk about God's faithfulness. And he uses Abraham and how God came and um, that Abraham was, alt was actually justified, declared righteous, in other words, because he put his faith in God. And so even in the Old Testament, the proof is there that you are saved by faith and not by what you do. Not by keeping the law, it's by putting your faith and your trust in God. And that's the point that he's making in chapters 3 and 4. And then, of course, it results in a life of freedom. Chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. And Paul grapples with, with this whole issue because we, we're not totally free in this world. We have been set free by Jesus Christ. Uh, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God, he says in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith. And we rejoice in the hope and so on. And he talks about this life of freedom. We are free from sin. We are free from the law. We are free now to live in the Spirit. And in chapter 8, there is one of the best descriptions of the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives uh, that you can find anywhere. And it ends with uh, the section on being more than conquerors and where nothing can separate us from the love of God. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, I've referred to this earlier on. Paul then starts talking about, okay, so where does it leave Israel? Uh, if, if, God, um, if, if God has now changed and moved on and Israel no longer plays this major role and is not just Jews who are saved, then uh, where does it leave Israel? And he has in chapters 9, 10, and 11 a description of that. And uh, people interpret this very differently uh, depending on your view and your overall theology. Uh, you may take a particular approach to the nation of Israel, but that's essentially what he's talking about there, and I, we don't have time to go into more detail. Chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 are very practical. He then talks about being a, a living sacrifice. He talks about love. Uh, he talks about, in chapter 13, how we need to submit to the authorities of the day, uh, which is quite amazing when you think about Paul being persecuted often, by the authorities, and not many years after this, he would end up being persecuted himself by Rome. And, and still, he says, our duty as Christians is to submit to the authorities. He has something to say about the weak and the strong. And uh, this, is, this has always been a question, and that is, uh, so how far can I go uh, in terms of, of eating meat, for example, certain kinds of meat? If, I, if I'm no longer, uh, Paul would say, I'm, I'm a Jew, uh, am I bound to eat only kosher meat? Uh, can I eat pork or can I not eat pork? Uh, the question in those days would also be, uh, we know that some people, before they cook the meat, they, they dedicate it to an idol. Sort of they have a little ceremony where they dedicate the meat, then they cook the meat and then they put it in front of us to eat. Now the Christians would say, can I or can I not eat this meat? Because it's been dedicated to an idol. Paul actually, his argument is, I'm free. It's meat. There's no, there's no demon in a meat, in a piece of meat. I can eat any meat. But there may be a weaker brother who doesn't hold my view. I'm strong in my faith and my belief. I, I can eat meat, any meat. And I won't be bowled over uh, or go lost uh, or anything like that. But there may be a weaker brother. And for the sake of the weaker brother, I may withhold from eating the meat. Although I personally believe it, it is not wrong. And so that's part of his argument in chapter 14 um, and also into chapter 15. And then he talks about himself, his ministry to the Gentiles. And then in chapter 16, uh, 
which I've already referred to, Paul has a long list of people uh, to whom he is sending greetings in the city of Rome. And then he brings the letter to a conclusion uh, at the end of that. The general themes that we find, all mankind is lost. We've talked about that. I'm not going to go further. Justification by faith and by faith alone. You are never, ever, ever justified by either your birth, the way you live, or the things you do. It is purely based on the, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, it's by the grace of God that you are justified. The importance of dealing with sin and living a holy life. Uh, and this has always been a question for Christians. Okay, so if I am saved by God, by His grace, then I'm free to do anything and everything. And Paul says, well, yes and no. Yes, you are free, but no, you can't do sin. You're not free to do sin. You're not free to live in sin. You're free to live for Christ. That's what He's made you free of. You're, not, you're free to be, not to be bound by legalistic requirements. Wear this kind of dress. Uh, have this day or that hour. or you, can, you must pray then. Those rules and regulations you're completely free of. You don't have to keep them. But what, what you need to do is to live for God. And if you want to live for God, you've got to be holy. And so chapter 6 and 7 are about that. The, uh, the fact that we are free... But at the same time, we need to ho live holy lives, lives that glorify God. And the, the, the um, sequence is reversed. I don't live in order to be saved. I live holy. Sorry, I don't live holy in order to be saved. I live holy because I am saved. So I'm saved first. Now I live holy, not the other way around. And that's what the point that Paul is making. He uses himself in a, as an example how often he struggles uh, with sin in his life and how you have to say no to the flesh and that's the literal word used there the, the sinful desires in me well up and I constantly need to deal with that uh, it gives us the impression that, um, that even Paul needed to struggle from time to time with sin uh, in his own life chapter 8 is about life in the spirit I've referred to that already it's a beautiful chapter uh, well worth reading and studying and uh, applying and then we talked about the practical implications of living by faith. Chapter 12 is dedication to God. Again, it's a wonderful chapter. Citizenship, respecting the weaker brother. I've referred to the ending of Rome. If you, if you open up there uh, at any point in time, you will immediately see, even in the NIV, you will see how they've listed the names in sequence, which is not done in the original Greek. But um, this is the way they've done it. it uh, when you come to chapter 15, uh, verse 30, it says, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle. Verse 31, pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers when I go to Jerusalem. And then verse 33, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now, that sounds like an ending to the letter. The reality is, he goes on, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant. And then he goes on and he says, greet Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla. Uh, and he has a long list of 26 persons at least whom he is greeting in a church he didn't plant and he's never been to Rome. So the question is, how does he know all these people who live in Rome in order to give them greetings? And so scholars, some scholars will say and argue, well, chapter 16 must have been added later on to give. Maybe Paul didn't write the letter. This is the argument. Maybe Paul didn't write the letter and therefore someone else added this to make it a bit, look a bit more authentic uh, at some later point in time. How do we respond to that? Well, I think personally there's very, very, very little doubt among even the most liberal of scholars um, that Paul ever wrote this letter. Paul wrote this letter. I mean, that is probably held to by 90% of people anyway. There is no doubt that the text that we have in front of us is real and there is no proof, no evidence that this chapter never belonged to the letter of Rome. We have no, in all of the, I refer to, the, to this already, all of the thousands of manuscripts we have, there is no evidence in the book of, Rome, of, of Romans uh, that this chapter is not part of that. Uh, so it's, there is no text, textual critical problem. Um, in terms of an explanation, probably, Rome was a universal city. Uh, and it's not uncommon for people to travel. They did travel. And over the many years that Paul traveled, he met many different people, including Aquila and Priscilla, whom he mentions uh, in this chapter. Uh, 
they must have traveled and they must have been back in Rome by this time uh, because that was the done thing. Um, in our day and time, uh, you can write to people in Australia and greet South Africans or London and greet South Africans, uh, although you may, I, I've never been to Australia, but I can tell you I know several people in Australia right now, in fact, not just a few. And so being a, a, a sort of a universal city, it is not uncommon for Paul to have known some people there. Also, Paul greets more people in Rome than he does in any of the other letters. The reality is that in, a, in his church that he didn't plant, he needed to establish himself and his own authority, and he needs to give himself a bit more credibility. So in mentioning people that are common, common knowledge to, to, to them and to him, he established that credibility uh, so that he can actually write to them with some kind of authority. I give you some key passages to read, and um, if you want to get a feel for the book of Romans, then uh, these are some of the key passages that you have to read. Uh, some of these have really been wonderful influences. I mean, just to give you one quick example, in Romans chapter 11, for example, Paul comes to the end of that explanation of the, the, the nation of Israel. He doesn't give us enough to really emphatically say, yes, God has another place for Israel, or no, God does not. He talks about this mystery of God, that somehow God... Uh, is, is, has, has uh, fulfilled his purposes with Israel, is bringing in the Gentiles, but God is not rejecting Israel either. Uh, God will never reject anybody. Uh, that's not in God's nature to do that. And, and looking at this mystery and how it all fits together, Paul simply comes to the end of chapter uh, 11 and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's just the ending of chapter 11. That's the book of Romans. It takes us to uh, the letters uh, that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. I call them letters to a troubled church. When we look at the location of Corinth, we had another map earlier on, but on this map, uh, you won't see it over here, but this is, this is sort of Greece over there with Corinth uh, sitting right there. Um, in antiquity, Corinth was a city-state on the isthmus of Corinth, the narrow stretch of land that joins the Peloponnesus to the mainland of Greece. To the west of the isthmus lies the Gulf of Corinth, to the east the Saronic Gulf. Corinth is about 78 kilometers or 48 miles southwest of Athens. And in ancient times, interestingly enough, I never knew this, but they actually took ships uh, on dry land on um, rocky ridges across that. But now there's a canal that's been cut through, so it's, it's much easier to bring uh, ships right through there. The city of Corinth, against the background of some of the columns the remaining columns of the Temple of Apollo in ancient uh, Corinth. Corinth was the largest city of Greece, the capital of Achaia, an important city for commercial, social exchange, not a, not a poor place. Certainly, uh, there were many wealthy people living there. There was also a sizable Jewish fa um, uh, community in Corinth. It became notorious for its immorality, temples, sinfulness, uh, and it can be seen from uh, the quote, and, I, and here I'm quoting Wikipedia. The lower city was the location of the temple of Apollo, while the Acrocorinth was dominated by the temple of Aphrodite. Greek writers in the 5th to 4th centuries BC characterized Corinth as a city of commercialized love, and a Corinthian girl meant a prostitute. Actually, the term Corinthian girl was equal to a prostitute. And so that gives you a bit of an idea uh, of the background, and therefore some of the issues that we pick up in Corinthians, especially in 1 Corinthians, uh, would, would make a lot more sense uh, if you then read it against this kind of, of background. Uh, here is a, a satellite picture of that particular region with Corinth right there in that narrow strip, as you can see, and this area called Achaia, and then Athens as well. The site of ancient Corinth was, the first, was first inhabited in the Neolithic period, 5000 to 3000 BC. 
destroyed in 146 um, and then uh, representative of its wealth is the Doric Temple of Apollo, which was built in 550 BC. The city was re-inhabited in 44 BC, re-established and re-inhabited, and gradually developed again. By 51, 52 AD, Apostle Paul visited Corinth, and that's the, the story that I told you that is contained, or proved, rather, by the discovery of the Gallio inscription. Corinth, uh, during the Roman Empire, um, became the seat of government for southern Greece, or Achaia. It was noted for wealth, luxurious, immoral, uh, and vicious habits of the people. It had a large mixed population of Romans, Greeks, and Jews. When the Apostle Paul first visited uh, in 51-52, Gallio, the brother of Sen Seneca, was proconsul. And um, you can read the rest there. The church in Corinth, and this is against uh, a Roman fountain, uh, this picture, there's a Roman fountain there, just some of the remains that have been excavated. Uh, the church in Corinth, Paul arrived in Corinth during his second missionary journey. Uh, that is described for us in Acts chapter 18. The church started in the synagogue, uh, but soon after that it moved elsewhere when the Jews rejected Paul. So often Paul would preach for several Sabbath days, several Saturdays he would preach in a, in a synagogue. And then oftentimes, either because some of the Jews didn't like Paul or they didn't like the story, or they became jealous of many people following this new way, then there was opposition and uh, they were chased out of the synagogue. The church had an excellent start under Paul. He stayed there for 18 months at least, uh, which is one of the longest stays. He stayed longer in the city of Ephesus, as we'll see uh, later on. Uh, and it was here that he was brought uh, before the proconsul Gallio, probably in about 51 AD. There is another little bit of information, historical information or archaeological information. Uh, if you read, if you look at this picture over there, you can barely make it out, but there is an E R A S T, and that is, uh, represents a U and S, Erastus. And it's called the Erastus inscription. And it provides us another link with the Apostle Paul. In 1929, this inscription was found mentioning Erastus as the one who paid for the paving in the street in return for his appointment as a city officer. Does that sound roughly familiar uh, to you? Uh, it is likely that this is the same Erastus mentioned by Paul as sending greetings to the church at Rome in Romans chap uh, chapter 16, verse 23. And is so then Paul's influence apparently extended to wealthy and influential Roman citizens uh, of the city of Corinth. Um, and again, we have no exact proof, but this is a, a likely little bit of, of a connection with him. Paul's relationship with, uh, with Corinth is an interesting one. And what we are going to do, what I'm going to do, is to try and introduce you to the relationship as Paul visited and wrote the letters. We have two letters uh, in our New Testament uh, that survived and entered into our New Testament. But by studying the information that we have in the book of Acts and in the letters that Paul wrote, it seems like there was a long-standing relationship between him. Some contacts, some letters, and also letters that they wrote to Paul that we no longer have a copy of, and those things are lost uh, to us. Uh, but what I want to do is to try and list um, the, the different visits and letters, and thereby describing some of the back and forth relationship between Paul and the Corinthians. And here we have a reconstruction of the map of ancient uh, Corinth as, as people have done their archaeological digs. They were able to discover and uncover many of the things of ancient Corinth. Paul's first visit is described for us in uh, Acts chapter 18, and that is probably 51-52, and that is when he encountered Gallio. Then Paul, and this is interesting, when you go to chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, our first letter, chapter 5, verse 9, Paul says, I have, written, I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Again, can I just highlight the fact that already we've now discovered that Corinth was a very immoral city. And so this provides us with some of the backdrop. So Paul wrote to the city, or to the church rather, to not associate with sexually immoral people. Now, the church then came to the conclusion uh, 
that they should avoid contact with the world out there altogether. And Paul is now writing to them saying, uh, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers and are, or idolatrous. In that case, you would have had to leave the world. He's saying, you can't get out of the world. You, you're living in the world. But he was referring to people who are sexually immoral in the church. The point that I want to make now is that Paul is talking about a previous letter that he wrote. He said, in my letter, and this is 1 Corinthians. And he's saying, I have written you in my letter not to associate with those people. So he's obviously re referring to a letter he's already written to them before. This letter is lost to us. We don't have a copy of it. The church answered Paul, proof of which we find in chapter 7. Now for the matters you wrote about. Again, this is 1 Corinthians. Paul is responding in, in 1 Corinthians to a letter that the Corinthian church already wrote him. And he's responding to that. So there's a letter that the church wrote also miss, missing to us, lost to us. Paul responded by writing 1 Corinthians. Now perhaps, therefore, the second letter that he was already writing to them, at least the second letter that, he, that he's writing to them. He is in Ephesus. The year is about 55. So it's a few years on from when he started the church. And he's addressing some problems in the church and answering some of the questions. Uh, and it's very clear when you read through the letter that it, this was back and forth conversation all the time. Either people coming to Paul telling him about, about stuff or they have written to Paul or they have questions um, about certain issues of marriage and eating of idol worship stuff and, and so on and so on. The relationship actually goes on. The church did not respond well to this letter, this 1 Corinthians letter, it seems like. And Paul decided to visit them again um, at some point in time. When and how exactly, that is not 100% clear. But when you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Now, you can hardly describe the first visit as a painful one. Paul, in Acts chapter 18, spends 18 months there preaching, visiting, planting the church, uh, bringing people to Christ. This is not a painful visit. So obviously Paul must be referring to another visit. And even as you go through the book of Acts, it is clear that we don't have uh, a blow-by-blow -blow description of every single trip that the Apostle Paul did. We have a very general description of where he went, but then it says he went through the region and he visited many of the cities or churches that he planted. That's all it says sometimes. So it's very clear that not every little uh, detail in the life of, of Paul is described for us by Luke in Acts. Uh, Paul refers to a similar kind of letter, or uh, not letter, but visit in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. Now I'm ready to visit you for the third time. So again, it's very obvious that Paul is referring to two previous visits. The planting visit, a painful visit, and is now getting ready to visit them a third time already. And then also you can verify that looking at chapter 13. This will be my third visit to you, chapter 13, verse 1. Still, the response seemed, uh, according to the information we have in 2 Corinthians, that wasn't very good. And Paul writes a painful letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. I wrote as I did, that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to, be, to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Now, again, when I read through 1 Corinthians, and this is what scholars are saying, you don't get the impression this is a painful letter. Paul is not writing with tears dropping on the page, as it were. He's writing a fairly good letter, some guidance and some very st uh, strong uh, disciplinary uh, comments that he makes. But it's not painful as in, you hurt me and therefore I'm writing to you. And so there, there, there seems to be a painful letter somewhere that is also missing to us. We don't have a copy uh, of that letter. This time the response by the Corinthians seems to be positive and so... Uh, some of Paul's co-workers come and they report that, maybe in another letter or whatever, which is not known to us. And then, and only then does Paul write 2 Corinthians. So, 
we're talking about three different, well, two visits at least. There's the church planting visit. There is a previous letter. There is 1 Corinthians. There's an in-between visit, which is a painful visit. There is a painful letter. And then there's 2 Corinthians. And then what happened after that, we're not exactly sure. So we're talking about a long-standing relationship between Paul and the church at Corinth. When we look at 1 Corinthians in particular, then we're looking at a, a letter addressing some problems uh, in the church. In terms of the writing, very little doubt that Paul wrote it. He wrote to the Corinthian church in response to his concerns about them, questions that they put to him, reports that Paul received from uh, different people. He was now on his third missionary journey. He was in Ephesus and he was writing this letter probably about 55 AD. The purpose? The purpose is exactly what I've already said, and that is to address these issues, things that Paul heard, and also letters that they have written to him. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in chapter 1, verse 10, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brother, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there, were, there are quarrels among you. What I mean is, and then he goes on to talk about those quarrels, I'm of Paul and I'm of Simon and so on. Um, and so he has received reports from other people that things are not that kosher at the church in Corinth. In the letter, he, he's then addressing the divisions in the church, uh, which I started reading, sinful and wrong behavior by members of the church, chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur uh, even among pagans, and that is that a man has his father's wife and, and so on. So, sinful behavior, chapter 6 again. If any of you has a dispute with one another, dare he take it before ungodly people? Um, he's heard that some people have gone to local judges with their own little Christian disputes and so on, and he says that's un, uh, unacceptable. And then I've already read chapter 7, verse 1. Now, now for the questions that you ask me. They've obviously written him, and uh, he is addressing those uh, questions. In terms of contents of 1 Corinthians, it developed out of Paul's concern from the reports. He used the opportunity to give guidance to the church, to teach them. Um, and we are ever so grateful for a troubled church. If it wasn't for this troubled church, and 1 Corinthians ending up in our New Testament, we would be a lot poorer about many different things, such as the gifts in chapter 12, such as the love chapter in, in chapter 13, the, the issue of uh, tongues and prophecy in chapter 14, uh, the resurrection chapter in 15. And we would be a lot poorer if it wasn't for a church that was troubled and Paul addressed that particular issue or those issues. Chapters 1 to 4 describe Paul's uh, understanding of ministry and Jesus and where he fits into uh, that whole picture. His view of his own ministry there. Some of the major themes that we find in 1 Corinthians, the foundation of our faith, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, just when you look at chapter, chapter 1 where Paul talks about Jesus, uh, he says in, in chapter 2, verse, verse 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified came to you in weakness, he said. And the one thing I wanted you to know is Jesus. I didn't want to attach you to me. He goes on to say, I didn't even baptize many of you. Because it's not about baptism, it's about Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is all about. And that provides us with the foundation. Sexual behavior is a, another major theme that we find uh, in this book. Christians and lawsuits uh, and how you shouldn't go to necessarily go to uh, secular people to do that. Marriage. Uh, chapter 7, a long description of marriage and what it means. Meat and idols, again that issue that Paul addressed, uh, or that he later on will address as well with the Romans, uh, he also addresses here, and that is, what about those um, uh, invitations we receive to go and have a meal, but we know that the meat has been offered or dedicated to idols, and Paul addresses that in chapter 8 and also in chapter 10. The church at worship. In chapter 11, we have another description of the communion or the Lord's Supper. Uh, Paul says what we have received. For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. And then he talks about uh, 
the communion practice uh, where Jesus broke the bread. Spiritual gifts, I've referred to this, 12, 13, and 14. We have those uh, gifts uh, described, the chapter on love and the resurrection chapter, uh, chapter 15. And there is a list of passages that you can read if you want to know more about 1 Corinthians and get a feel for uh, this letter. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is the consolation letter. It, is, uh, it was born uh, in, a, in a painful situation. There was a painful visit. There was a painful letter. And, and then something went right. And the, the church seems to have uh, reestablished their relationship with Paul. And Paul writes this letter out of a grateful response for what is happening. And uh, this is the way he kicks off in chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the Father of all, all, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in, in, any, tro- those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Uh, I mean, you, you can't miss that, the, the number of times he uses the word comfort. God has comforted him and is now writing. Uh, to comfort the church as well. The writing of 2 Corinthians may be the fourth, perhaps even the fifth letter, we don't know, that he wrote to the church. He writes about 56 AD after having left Ephesus to travel north. It's all he's saying. We don't know north where. Maybe to go and visit Macedonia and those places once again. He had a positive response from his previous letter, not 1 Corinthians, but the painful letter, and he's writing to thank them and to bring comfort. He is comforted and he wants to comfort them as well. He writes to express his joy at the fact that the relationship seems to be on track once again. When you go through Second Corinthians, the message, the underlying theme is that of participation in the gospel may result in suffering. He actually kicks off that way. I've, I haven't read that a little bit, but he says, For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Uh, And and as you go through the book, it's very clear that Paul says, if we are Christians and we preach the gospel and we live for Christ, there will be sufferings. Um, and, um, uh, And in Christ there is victory. Because the physical sufferings that we endure um, are nothing compared to the fact that God is bringing us comfort. And God is the source of our joy and comfort. Paul has something to say about the new covenant. uh, And he compares it with the old one. And the old one uh, brought about some shiny face for Moses. But the new one is glorious in that the veil has been taken away. There's no need to cover cover it up anymore. And the new covenant really gives us um, this, this new glory that comes from God. There is a deeper understanding of stewardship over here. Chapters 8 and 9 um, actually is, is probably our most extensive description of giving, uh, where Paul collected, as he was traveling around, he collected some money for the, poverty, uh, the, the poor people, um, uh, the, the Jews in Jerusalem at the time. And um, here he describes to them, this is the way he starts that in chapter 8, and now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that, that has been given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty, welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. They even begged Paul to give them the privilege of participating in the giving, so that they can um, be good stewards of what God entrusted to them. Paul also talks about ministry in the New Covenant, um, and you will come up against uh, suffering and hardship, uh, helping to keep us humble. Um, And this is where he talks about his own ministry in chapter 10 as well. The focus of the second Corinthian letter, he elaborates on his own ministry and his own involvement. It's It's almost a defense of his ministry with the Corinthian church, and he discussed with them the fact that The basis for this ministry is Jesus the cross, not himself. The purpose of ministry is the glory of God, this new covenant. Um, The price of ministry is sacrifice, persecution that they will endure or suffering. Uh, The authority in his ministry says, I'm a herald. I'm proclaiming the gospel uh, to you. Uh, 
And then also the, his role in ministry is that of connecting people to God. Um, again, as I said in chapter 1, he says, I'm glad that I didn't baptize a lot of you because that, some people may brag that they were baptized by me. Uh, it's not my role to baptize people. My role is to connect them to God. Um, so we have a very humble Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians. Some of the key passages that you can read in 2 Corinthians is comfort in God, uh, the glory of the new covenant in chapter 3. Reconciliation is another beautiful um, passage that we have in 2 2 Corinthians, where, where Paul talks about his role and our role in reconcil- the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, he calls that in, in uh, verses 11 and further. Um, if you want to know something about Paul's suffering, chapter 11, is um, 2 Corinthians 11, is Paul boasting about his sufferings. He says, let no one uh, take me for a fool, in, in verse 16. But if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool so that I may do a little boasting. And he goes on in uh, verse 20, What anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews, so am I. Uh, am, are they Israelites, so am I. Are they Abraham's descendants, yes, so am I. Are they servants of Christ, I'm out of my mind. To talk like this, he say, I'm more. I've worked harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day on the open sea. Uh, and so it's a description of the many, many sufferings that he endured uh, as an apostle. I want to encourage you to read your textbooks. Um, We don't have time to go through the passages in the Bible, but I want to encourage you to not only read the textbooks, but actually read the Bible. Even if you just page through those chapters that that we have been looking at tonight, just to get a feel for Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then take another look at the map. We're going to be all over the map for the next number of weeks as we travel with the Apostle Paul, as it were, as he writes a letter. He's here, he writes over there, Uh, Where is he? Uh, So just in your mind to get a bit of a clearer picture of the geography of the area so that you can know when we talk about he's in Ephesus and he writes to Corinth uh, what what we're actually talking about. And then next week we're going to look at Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians. So enjoy the week and may the Lord bless you. Thanks for coming.